So here's our artist of the day, Faith Ringgold. Born in 1930 in Harlem and now lives in Englewood, New Jersey. Uh, she's a painter, a writer, performance artist. She's done paintings, quilts, soft sculpture, made masks. She's a social activist, an ardent feminist. And she does, as the artists we will look at next time, figurative representational art with messages that we are to forget. So that will set her apart from the, the two women we've looked at so far. She's written her memoirs. I haven't read them now in 2005. Let's see, it's called um, We Flew Over the Bridge, the Memoirs of Faith Ringgold. And I think she has a quite a trenchant mind and trenchant speaking style, which is entertaining. So I imagine it's something well worth looking into and I will in time get around to it. I, I don't want to talk too much about her personal history in terms of the actual data, just some. As I say, she was born in Harlem and a factoid. One of her good friends growing up was Sonny Rollins, who just lived down the block. Her um, father worked, I think he had a union job and her mother was uh, quite well known in the neighborhood as a seamstress and a um, dress designer. So she grew up in a, a fairly comfortable, um, quite middle-class environment in Harlem. And it would, would have been unusual for her day that um, her parents encouraged her to go to college. So she, she went to uh, City College. She knew she wanted to go into art. And I believe it was in City College for your undergraduate degree at that time, uh, <clears throat> just a straight out like painting or sculpture major was not available, but she could get a bachelor's in art education, which she did. And um, it will be that for early years in her career, she, she taught in the uh, New York public schools. So she's just by, probably by instinct and by training, an educator. <clears throat> she married young, uh, her husband died after not very many years of um, drug overdose. But she had two daughters, has two daughters. <clears throat> and then she married, married again later in her life. But um, she, she went back to City College and got her MFA, which is the terminal top degree you can get in, a, in, in an actual art field. <clears throat> so she has um, all the credentials, which is increasingly important for artists nowadays if they need to make any money out of something other than the production of their work. Uh, her initial works, I, I have no illustrations from because um, from what I read, she was doing the traditional competent landscapes, still lifes, uh, representational art um, that she too, as almost any 20th century trained person, <clears throat> was steeped in Picasso and Matisse, those two rivals who spurred each other on to better and better work. So um, it wasn't until after her husband's death, and I imagine the children were growing up somewhat, <clears throat> that she was able to focus increasingly on painting. So. In this way, she is the polar opposite of Helen Franklin Holland. That she she didn't she was didn't have this meteoric rise when she was a youngster, and that somewhat affects what she does. Um, and I, I have a lot that I will read from what she's she's written about herself and her her thoughts and what she's done. <clears throat> but she found that that gave her a kind of freedom because no one was paying attention to her and she could find her way. So let me give you some more portraits of her. 
since there is now at the Met the, this great show of Alice Neal's paintings, there is an Alice Neal portrait of Faith that I did not show when I once for a meal lectured on Alice Neal. Because when I look at this, I think this is not a very good painting. <clears throat> but it, it was done about 1977 when Alice was just emerging into the general Manhattan art scene. Um, and uh, <clears throat> evidently Faith herself later expressed some regret, not about this painting, but that she didn't agree with what Alice Neal had asked her to do, which was to pose in the nude, as Alice did for her own artistic self-portrait a couple of years later. <clears throat> this wonderfully daring painting. And this is quite conventional. As um, by this time, Al um, Faith had been to, made two trips to Africa. So she was increasingly with her beads and the flamboyance of her dress, uh, emphasizing her, her black heritage. But <clears throat> she, she, as I said, she, she regretted later that she had not let Alice do what she wanted. And Alice painted this in just one sitting. Because I think what it misses is the keenness of Faith's take on the world. Just look at that gaze out at you. <clears throat> you know, she thinks, she looks, and she has opinions. Which she will express in her art. So this is also her self-portrait. And this is when she's now beginning to get some recognition in the kind of work she was doing. <clears throat> this is her self-portrait from, let's see, let me give you the 65. So she's just emerging on the scene. She's in her mid-30s. The it's a painting that's in the Brooklyn Museum. It's a little bit cropped in the image here because it's shown um, this oh, the central oval is like it's on a small um, pedestal of the kind that you have as a base for a a portrait bust and sculpture. And this it's, it's almost like this is a con the conceit as if this is a half length sculptured portrait. But <clears throat> she presents herself in a very composed way. The colors of Africa and just bold simplified colors. This will be her early style. In some sense, you wouldn't guess this was a self portrait. You don't see her with any of the accoutrements of a painter and she doesn't have her hand out, so the hand that would be painting, which is often the giveaway when you have a self, artistic self-portrait. So it's just this very composed um, image, but the boldness of the color, the simplicity of the shapes, the strong outlines, that's gonna be very characteristic of her early work. And in that she is deliberately not only calling up some associations with Africa, but also folk art, that she is um, not avoiding, but sort of putting to one side her, her very conventional traditional training. And part of that is because she is wanting to reach a different audience and um, an audience that might be more familiar with folk art as well as African art. In this, uh, she did say something later about this. She said, I'm trying to find my voice. I'm talking to myself through my art. So it's clearly a mental dialogue she's having here. And in the mid 60s, she begins to work in series. Uh, that is something that was uh, typical of Jacob Lawrence and also Romare Bearden, two um, black artists preceding her who were also concerned with social themes, which she will be. 
so she's a woman now following in that pattern that those men had established. And she does this series called American People. And she does it in the mid 60s, which are of course a very turbulent time in American history. And this is gonna be the time of the race riots of uh, great disruption between the blacks and the whites and the rise of black power. You kind of get a sense of that in this one. This is the number six in this series from 64. It's called Mr. Charlie. Well, Mr. Charlie is evidently, her, 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 her era encompasses both when people are called black and when they're called African-American. So I'm not sure what at this stage to call it. I think it was African-American. What African-American artists would call racist white men. They're all Mr. Charlie. And James Baldwin had just, um, his play, The Blues for Mr. Charlie, had just been staged the year before. So it makes a, um, a sort of a, a source for this. It's, it's not small, it's almost three feet high. Just this kind of narrow poster-like image. And it is just this cropped view. You, ha you have the full painting right here. <clears throat> So what come, I think you would, it's certainly social commentary. Whether you want to call her a social realist, she didn't exactly identify herself as one, <clears throat> but she is commenting as she will always on the life she sees around her. So here you have Mr. Charlie um, in his nice tightly collared and tied uh, shirt with his suit. One feature to look at that's very expressive are these unusually long and slender fingers. They're quite delicate. And this gesture as if he has his hand, were you to be saying the Pledge of Allegiance or his hand over the heart uh, to be an expression of sincerity. Well, if you heard my cat, the cat commented already on that. This does not look very sincere. This is just like an applied gesture. What about this face? What kind of mask like? If this is to be a sincere person, he's not looking at anything with sincerity. He doesn't seem to be acting with sincerity. Just wait a moment to look at it more. He's just sort of frozen here. Now it's it's a it's a lovely painting. As I'll go back to that detail, just from the abstract sense of these nice shapes and the clear breaking it into different color areas. It's it's um you know it's a, it's a very a, this is a talented painter at work just knowing where to break that line so that that is enough to imply the facial structure, the bony structure, the shape of the cheeks without doing any interior modeling, no modeling in light and shade at all. Or in this form here. And these very small, even teeth, quite a predator's mouth. <clears throat> this one from the same year is called The In Crowd. It's all there for you to see. There are blacks. They're definitely the bottom of the heap. And look at all these figures, essentially, you wouldn't say that was a gesture of uh, affection. You wouldn't even call this affection, would you? Isn't this the person, this is the, the top dog here, pushing the others down, pushing down, 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 and muzzling the mouth and pushing down. 
So she's making a complete statement about the male social organization, the role of the sexes. And I imagine you could probably even see some sort of different facial types and, and read from them. There, this is, we're gonna see, she uses this too. There, there's this red arrow in the back and it comes down. And she said she used that really to indicate that this is sort of society in decline, that things are going down. Nothing, nothing overt. It's just a, a suggestion there. This one is called the American Dream. That same year, about the same size. This with such simplicity of means, she does so much. First of all. The, the American dream, of course, is this is the woman's dream. She's, she's you know, her hair beautifully styled, mascara, perfect, nice big red lips, the kind that de Kooning will make fun of, and this flashy diamond ring she has over here. Um, dressed very well, probably for evening. And look at her face. Do you see there are two people here? It's not just that there's a white complexion and a dark complexion, but the angle that that eye is looking, the, the alert outward gaze of that face is very different from this side. <laughs> so she plays with some of the complexity of the society right there. And also she does, all throughout her life in art so far, continue to have some kind of dialogue with Picasso as, as much as Helen Frankenthaler had done also in her, um, especially in her earlier years. Because, well, what I'm, I'm thinking of here, um, just because this is the image we keep going back to is kind of the lodestar of this 1907, slightly pre-Cubist, um, Picasso of the Demoiselles at Davignon, which of course she knows because she's in this Museum of Modern Art and she's in, in um, a Manhattanite. But it's this face, that kind of scoop of the nose and the slight shift from one eye to the other in the angle of the face. Now these are based on African masks, which Picasso was seeing because he went to the Ethnographic Museum in Paris, which was not too much visited at that time. And he saw in them, uh, it was like a revelation of just that he, he saw a kind of a magical vitality and intensity of spirit in that. And that was helped him sort of pull himself back from and away from the Western tradition. Well, do you see something that same shape to the face here? It's not blatant. I'll come back to this later on with an explicit statement from her. And there again, oh, wait a minute. So again, you have that red arrow. I think it's quite uncanny the way she's put these two people together here. It not only talks about it being a biracial society, but how bifurcated it is, how very different the two halves are two parts and halves. And this also is from the American um, scene, uh, American People series. This is a woman looking in a mirror. This is two years later in 66. Um, it's about the same, but again, not quite three feet high. Well, she's again addressing the whole tradition of Western art from the point of view of someone who is both part of that Western art, trained in it, living in the West, and also someone who is apart from it because she is from um, slave heritage from Africa and that she's black in America. Now, what does she have that's part of the Western tradition here? Well, it's the whole theme of the woman looking in the mirror. I mean, that's just age old in Western art. I'll give you just three examples for that. 
But of course, the coloration proclaims that she's black. The simplification, again, is a little bit more like folk art. And uh, do you see here to the, the face and profile? Possibly is the same person, but they don't think up that she's looking out somewhere and she's looking more straight this way. And that's also gonna be true of the tradition of these women looking in a mirror. The media, you see again, she's doing a simplification. It just takes this curve, which is really shaped like a golf tee almost, isn't it? Bent. And we know that's the whole jawline and the whole curve of her throat. This was the immediate one that she would be responding to. It's Picasso's um, girl looking in the mirror, which is again in the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, it's a beautiful painting he did in the 30s, where he, in the face itself, you see that split, this young woman, a kind of a pale lavender, and then a more mask-like face here in yellow. People say, so, say this, youth, old age, moon, sun, uh, all kinds of dualities. And then of course, how she sees herself in the mirror is still slightly different from that. And these globular forms used for breasts, for the pelvic area, this, those are standard motifs in Picasso. Kind of funny here because they're also combined with this arm. He does this kind of play, playing so that you have male sexuality present, present in this as well. So that's one. And you see the heavy black outlines. Oh, that's a, something she incorporates. Go back to a medieval manuscript of a um, <clears throat> manuscript supposedly illustrating the lives of famous women. And this was the woman who was a painter. And here she's looking at herself in the mirror and then painting it right over here. This is from sometime in the 1400s. Or for the 1600s, you can take Titian's. Venus looking in a mirror where she's glancing at herself, but she turns at her body so that we can see her. This voluptuous, enjoyable body displayed in the midst of all these velvets and furs and satins. So th there are 20, I think, all together in that series. <clears throat> There's these American people and they ship slightly. This, this is still in the series and this is one um, I want to look at for just a little while. It takes the form of a, as if it were a postage stamp, it's big though. And this is done in 67 and it's called US postage stamp commemorating the advent of black power. She does it as if it were pop art, which is the reigning style of the Museum of Modern Art at that time. It's the new thing with these close ups, of sort of cartoon like treatment of the faces. Although they're limited, not even most, some of them with the full nose, but the nose and the eyes, you do see a different character in each one of these. Not just different appearances, but different personalities. The wide-eyed, look how different that wide-eyed is from this. A rather sultry look over here. Look at this heavy-lidded look over here. So, Well, when we all sitting around, I'd say, do you notice anything strange in here? Because of course it says black power. You can just read that right down here. And that makes an X with the 10 black faces here. You could stop to wonder to yourself, there's 10 faces out of that entire collection. 
signify power. But do you see this also says white power? I really had to work at this because I, I, I knew that before I could see it because I, I thought, really, really? Here's a W. Here's an H, I, T. You can see the top bar of the T over here. Here's the E. P, O, W, E, and R. And also subtlety here, white power doesn't need to declare itself. It is so pervasive a part of the structure that we don't even notice it. Now that's not accidental. That's what she meant to, it to convey. And the one at the modern, um, this is just at the end of the series the one called Die. And um, it's in the room with the Demoiselles d'Avignon. Purposely, um, partly it's because of a, something that's not there for, for many years until uh, it met the conditions of Picasso's will for the Guernica to be returned to Spain. Once he thought it was a truly democratic society, it was allowed to go. Until that time, it was in the Museum of Modern Art. So she, she, uh, that's another painting she grew up with. Now, the Guernica, which I will bring, show you again, uh, is about twice the size of this painting that she did, which is still oil on canvas. But we'll look at her die there. She evidently, I, I only got this from part of a YouTube video on her. She, she couldn't find anybody to take this painting for a long time, and then finally the, the modern did. Here's the full painting, forget the crease, that's good. This is an illustration taken from a, a book that, with a fold line in it. But the, I made a point of saying it's a full um, painting because she extends figures over both frames. So as well as at the top and bottom, that fits the 50s idea in, as in Fr Helen Frankenthaler's art that, Paintings should be all over. They should fill the entire canvas and that they should be big. She's so fully steeped in what's going on in art. I mean, she's a savvy woman, but it also carries the political message that this is chaos, mayhem, in which both blacks and whites are victims that extends beyond the frame. It's just something that continues as far as the eye could see and beyond. She said, uh, this had been her thinking, how could I as an African-American woman artist document what was happening about me? I was just trying to read the times and, and to me, everyone was falling down. Uh, she was especially struck by how much living in Harlem, there were almost like daily incidents of violence that never made it in any news, uh, not print news, not even tabloid news. It, it was just the condition of life. Now, the style in this looks different from what she did before, although she's still working with these sort of flat areas of color and using them to imply three dimensions. But there's another part, as I said, well, first of all, she is responding to Guernica. That rushing diagonal. That violence from one end to the other. She's very vocal about that was a source. But also the art of Jacob Lawrence. Um, this is a, not the best example that I might bring in of Jacob Lawrence's works similar to hers. It's from a series called American Struggle. I brought this one in because this is one recently rediscovered 
after the Met had a show of Jacob Lawrence's painting just pre shutdown, <clears throat> where there was one missing painting, or maybe two missing paintings from the series, hadn't been seen since the 50s, and they just had a photograph of it. Someone coming to the show said, Ah, I've seen that in someone's house. So they were able to get the actual painting. But <clears throat> this is a scene from the time of George Washington and had a text of George Washington down below. But it's these spiky forms and these diagonals. So the style she's using is, is quite a bit like Jacob Lawrence. So she's pulling on her, her um, African-American tradition and her European tradition simultaneously to, uh, to make this new combination. And this crazed look, you see there's no external source for any of this that you can see. They're, they're not responding to any particular enemy, nor are they particularly responding to one another. It's as if this were something that's just bursting out of them. This is pretty horrifying down here. So strong social commentary. Now I want to read something that was that she wrote in her her autobiography, um, because we're co coming to a point where there's like a, a shift in her art. She said, "Other older artists wrote my painting off as protest art, sometimes even dismissing them as merely history painting or social realism." Uh, she's Primarily, I think the context here is that she's talking about other black artists primarily, but this would apply to all painters. They were mostly people who had been badly burned during the communist scare of the 50s. They now wanted to keep their noses and palettes clean. Art from them was an abstraction, a fragment of an idea that nobody could understand, much less condemn. Now, you know, this would put Helen Frankenthaler in that category. An abstraction, a fragment of an idea that nobody could understand, much less condemn. However, I called my art super realism because I wanted my art to make a personal connection with its images and messages. The older artists were cautious, you know, trying to get by in the art world and not drawing attention to their blackness. Art is art, quality is the important thing. It doesn't matter what your color is, was the theme. They knew there was little or no support for artists in the black community. So what could be gained by alienating friends and contacts in the white art world? On the other hand, I was not concerned with friends or enemies. Being unknown and a newcomer, I had neither. I was concerned with making truthful statements in my art and having it seen. Younger black artists objected to my paintings of white people. Some neither understood nor accepted my need to make images of anyone but black people. Others, I was told, felt that my steely-eyed white faces were going too damn far. So there she places herself in the middle of the fray, the turmoil of arts in the 60s. And in the 60s, she, she herself started getting involved in political activism. Um, on, uh, and become more um, consciously uh, feminist. And she took part in a protest outside the Whitney Museum. There was a pro protest of artists um, that the Whitney wasn't showing uh, show almost no women's art and very few work examples of work <sighs> by Blacks. So the Whitney changed its policies, but the people who got in were Black men, not Black women. And that's what spurred her towards feminism. And the feminist strain will be extremely strong in, in her art. She was a, a vigorous and an effective apologist of, of feminism. You know, the two artists we dealt with now, like, feminist? No, not me. No, I just me. Just a, a waffle. <laughs> 
how can I deny the reality of myself? I'm black and I'm a woman. <clears throat> so with this change in her sort of like a sense of herself and this sense of the whole position of people like her in the art world, especially in the Manhattan art world where she wanted to make it, um, there comes a, another decisive change. In the early 70s, she with her daughters went, uh, went to Europe and they went to the Rijksmuseum where there was a exhibition of let me get it to you. Tibetan scrolls called tankas. You know, you can, you can buy these. I mean, you, you go to any head shop, you can get examples of these, um, which were um, paintings on silk or on fabric on cloth scrolls. They would be hanging scrolls, um, generally with a Buddhist scene in the middle. Now, what you're going to see that she takes over in particular, you see these inner framing panels of different fabrics. That's characteristic of what, what her subsequent work will do. But her aha in this was, this painting, I can roll up and take with me anywhere, in store anywhere. I don't need to have the, the cost or the, of the space or the cost of the materials to have a large canvas stretched and framed. And this begins the movement of her becoming a, an artist on cloth. You know, that ties in with her feminism. She says, what is typically women's art? It's their fabric arts. Also, that was typical of the uh, art that she saw being produced by women in, in Africa. So all of these coalesced and moved her. Then you remember her mother was a, 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 herself a fabric artist. I mean, being a dress designer and a seamstress, it was a kind of a, like a natural, if inspired move. And these were the first ones she did. She's still painting. Actually, this is the oil paint on a sort of canvas with the surrounds more like those tankas. And this, these are called um, slave rape. There's another version of slave rape, a different from, one from this, that's um, in, the, in the Newark Museum. These are from 1973, um, slave rape one, slave rape two, and slave rape three. And they're the portrait of Faith and her two daughters. So into this uh, august Buddhist tradition, on the pristine white walls of museums and contemporary art, she brings in the theme of the fate of black women in this country. When they are captured and sold. Of course, the women in her family had been slaves. I believe that's the one that's the portrait of faith. So remember, Sonia Delaunay was also making her art on cloth, whether it was embroidering on shoes or here this the coat that she did for Gloria Swanson. But in that um, with that conviction that the kind of a, the totally non-representational took you to a higher realm of, of thought and being, as well as this being very decorative, that's so different from the very pointed contextual way that Faith Ringo was wanting hers to go. So now she begins to do quilts. Altogether, she's done more than 130 of them so far, I guess. Um, and I know last time we were talking about how much did Helen's Tank and Taller's paintings get? I did come across something about how much Faith Ringgold's quilts sell for. Anywhere from half a million to five million is the, and there are many, many private um, 
individuals who want to buy them. So uh, I know there's there's one. I'll show you this one in the um, at the mat. I think McQuitney has one. Mm, I think almost all the museums around here do. The first I should say the first single show of her work she ever had, which is around this time, was at um, was at uh, in the at Rutgers. Well, so anyway, so this is probably her first quilt, which she uh, collaborated on with her mother. And she painted all these faces and it's just called Harlem Echoes. So these would be people she knew or remembered or had seen in Harlem. And then with a, a particular quilt pattern where there's sort of like eight triangles making here a rectangle, or you can do it in a square, which is a, evidently a very particular um, quilt pattern that comes from Central Africa. To get it large enough, it's, it's, we have to have it very blurry. But here she is with her mother working with her. So this is going to be another characteristic of women's art that it's collaborative work. And she always has assistants working with her, sometimes in the actual quilting or transferring parts of the design. Um, just never working out the visual, you know, the, the painted representational part, but all the rest of the quilt. So this first quilt she did, I don't think people would say, oh, you could just tell that that's a Faith Ring Gold quilt. This next one coming up, you would, because it's what, what she adheres to as her typical format. Henceforth, there's story quilts. There's a combination of a text and imagery. Now, this is, as is so often with her work, something that comes from multiple sources. Evidently, there was a tradition, there is a tradition in African textiles of writing on them. Now, I don't know anything about this, so I just passed that along as something I read because I do not know that. The, um, specifics of her, her saying why she did this was that evidently someone had contacted her about writing her autobiography and she did and she turned it in and it was rejected because it didn't fit the narrative of a black woman's life that the editors wanted. It was a life that was too comfortable, too middle class, too relatively privileged as in getting to go to college. There was no rape, no violence in her family. So it was turned away. She said, okay, then I'll just put it out where no one can prevent me from saying what I want to say. I will put it on quilts. And she does. This is a very early one. This uh, Who's Afraid of Aunt Jemima from 1983. Um, the text, I believe, reads just like a text would in um, a book, um, from right to left and top to bottom. The stories in the story, she will always um, create a character. They're always female. They're not herself. And they're stories that are empowering. That was especially important for this theme of Aunt Jemima, because there is a... Um, precedent to this that she would be thinking about. Another artist, a, a significant Black artist named Betty Saar, had made this assemblage. You see she's holding a small assemblage down here. Uh, <clears throat> this one, hers is from 72, so about a decade earlier. And it's called The Liberation of Aunt Jemima. So she had in this box, she had found, um, it, was, it was meant to be sort of like a holder of three by five cards or a little memo pad on which you'd write your grocery list with the pancake mix Aunt Jemima, Mammy on it. And then she's altered that, the face of the Mammy here by putting this crying white child in here and putting a gun in her hand. Um, 
so it's really a, a militant image. And then there are other antimonists in the background. And she said, um, so Betty Starr said, I'm use the derogatory image to empower the black woman by making her a revolutionary, like she was rebelling against her past enslavement. Now, Betty Sars. And Faith's mm. strategies are so very different because in this, she completely reimagines Aunt Jemima as a lovely young woman, a successful entrepreneur to whom some white people, when they died, left all their business. And she leads a very good, very good life. I have one panel, and you might be able to read some of what's written on it. You see, she does it as if it were written, um, well, you wouldn't say childish, but very simple handwriting and intentionally adopting a folk art style. You know from what you've seen that she's fully capable of doing something of extreme sophistication, not at all like a folk art. So I, I, I think you can read that in there. I'll leave it on for a few moments. So she will um, get rid of modeling. She um, gets rid of all she knows about three-dimensional perspective and uh, to create this sense of, now she's linked with the people of Africa. She's linked with the people of America. She's. Uh, emphasizing that she's a woman, she's reimagining and reconfiguring what a woman can do. And she's now claiming valid art has been made out of just cloth and quilts are valid art. They are no longer just objects made out of exigency and out of scraps of cloth so that um, you can have something to cover you. They're no longer just the kind of quilts that my great grandmother made when she was a slave. Um, they belong in museums. And I thought just because it's funny, look how differently she used text. Because again, it's to communicate. She wants everybody to be able to, to join her um, fully at the, between her on one side of the creation and you as the observer on the other. You meet and you understand one another. Whereas Picasso, when he uses text, it's for purely artistic function here. This is from, from a journal, it's a daily paper, but he's using the letters to play with the idea of the suggestion of something flat as print ought to be, but here you have forms penetrating right through it and emerging behind it. So he's playing a, a a visual game, an art game with it. Now, this is one that's in the, um, uh, the I'm told is now available to see. It's, it's called the street scene. It was done around the same time. She, she does this, there's a, this is the same building. And she tells the story of one person, three moments in his life in these three panels. That really melds storytelling imagery. This she did for the color purple after the movie was out. There are a number of writers who say, ah, you know, African-American women writers work in a way that's like a quilt also that take smashes and bits and they put them together. I'm moving along because I want to make sure we have time for one particular series. This is the one I'm assuming anyone who's been a teacher is most likely to be familiar with. And it's the one I could find the least about. She did a series of five. Um, this, this series is called Women on a Bridge in 1988. Uh, they're the fantasies of this young girl called Cassie Louise Lightfoot. And there are women in bridges in each of them. And this is the one, Tar Beach. This is in the Guggenheim. 
This quilt was done and then she was asked to produce the book, the book which then developed out of the quilt. So her way of painting, this will be a very, very fine cotton duck panel. Now she's painting in acrylic, which isn't going to seep into the canvas the way oils did. So she doesn't have that problem that uh, Helen Frankenthaler did with running paint. And she'll also use markers in this, this very minute detail um, to present the images. And then for the framing element, she goes to upholstery shops and gets high quality upholstery fabrics for these. Um, she is using a pattern, this triangular pattern, which is again, sort of carries out from the African one. And then she will plot which ones go all around. And frequently she will make colored additions she will alter in various ways these panels around here. I don't know if this one she did or not. Sometimes with markers, sometimes with brush. And this is another, this one was in the museum um, at, up here at Montclair Art Museum. This is Tarbush. <laughs> Uh, someone, uh, someone needs to mute. We're getting a, yeah. There's someone who's moving around and there's a humming in the background. Uh, yeah, would you please check that you're muted? Thank you. So here the story is told actually in the panel itself about Cassie dreaming that she could be anything because she's lying here. Uh, the part that I, I would don't know enough about is that I believe these of this series, she did additions so that there are um, simpler versions of the same image, some based on the book, but also based on the set of five. They're in additions of 16. So she had, had some way of print transferring the painting from one to the next. That's probably something you don't need to know. That's my puzzlement. And here's another one in this series. Cassie Lapps, what is it? winning on the New York Marathon. She's beating the man coming across the bridge. And then there's, she does a series called the French Collection, which is a nice play on the French Connection, the movie. Uh, there are all told um, 15 or 16 quilts in this. And this is the initial one. Again, we, we have this um, heroine. Her name is uh, Willia, Willia Marie. That's actually based on her, her own mother's name. And um, they go to, they're in Paris in the 1920s. So here's William, William Marie and her friend with their, their friend's three children. They're going through the Louvre and they're dancing. It's just called dancing in the Louvre. So who are the women who look, it's women who look with approval. They're the three Leonardo's in the Louvre, smiling down, enjoying the fact that these youngsters are not keeping museum decorum. They are giddy with happiness being in there. And they, they're enjoying the art and they're not walking by with you know, proper solemnity. So these are black women and women enjoying themselves all intruding into one of the great bastions of white male uh, museum. This also was at the Museum of Modern Art. Now this is William Marie uh, serving as the model in Matisse's studio. So it's this commentary that backs up a statement that's a 
truism in feminist scholarship about modern art, that modern art was made from the bodies of women because women's bodies are so often the subject matter. Is here his great painting, The Dance. And these are patterns that appear in uh, different paintings by Matisse. And then that all within her framing part. I don't expect, I don't remember. I remember it's squatting down to read the text, but I don't remember what it says here. This one, I will read you. Here she is um, in Picasso studio. This is in Massachusetts in the Worcester Art Museum. And this is from the text that she wrote on this. The European artists took a, artists took a look at us and changed the way they saw themselves. Aunt Melissa, you made me aware of that. Go to Paris, Willa Marie, you told me and soak up some of that Africana they used in those cube paintings. It's the African mask straight from African faces that I look at in Picasso's studio and in his art. See, there are some of his masks that he did own. He has the power to deny what he doesn't want to acknowledge, but art is the truth, not the artist. Doesn't matter what he says about where it comes from. We see where every time we look in the mirror. So that is her um, deep understanding, which people will concur with. A great deal of, of 20th century art is in fact based on the inspiration of looking outside Western tradition, not to the Orient as in the late 19th century, they looked to, to China and Japan, but instead to Africa. This also in the series, um, Picnic at Giverny. So that's of course, oh no, I didn't show you that. Mm, sorry, not yet. Here's self sunflowers quilting Viet Arl. And she put some um, black authors in here. Zora Neale Thurston was there and um, I can't remember who else. And look who's over here, the gardener. And these women, one, one of the things they say is that they, they saw this, this tormented looking little man who reminded them of Dutch, um, the man who had Dutch slave ships. I could only get it in the blurry version, I'm sorry. This is a picnic at Giverny. There's a, you see the water lilies. I believe one of these was my former Dean in here. These are major American feminist artists and art historians. And William Marie is painting them. And who's the model over here? That's Picasso. So it's quite amusing and quite pointed. Then I close with two others from a even later series called the American Collection Series. These are big quilts, about seven feet across. This, uh, we'll look at this one on the left first. We came to America. She gives her own face here. The Statue of Liberty has dreadlocks. The slave ship burning and sinking. And all the flailing, screaming, drowning blacks. And the flag is bleeding. Actually, this goes back to something she'd done in the 67. It's a reprise of that same scene. There where the flag is bleeding. See, this is that, that time from around that one that's a MoMA, the die. But here it's only one person bleeding. It's a black man that's almost obscured here. So is she America? Is all her nurturing bled out? And these are all painted on here, of course. 
for the last images, oh, there are so many worth seeing. One, you go to 125th Street on the, um, take subway line two or three. She did the uh, mosaics um, in the station at 125th. Heroes and heroines of Harlem. And in the 70s, she was not only doing quilts, but she did soft sculptures. And so she's also a multi multimedia artist. I'll just give you two of those. They sort of somewhat lighten the mood. She's got just a wickedly caricature. Just marvelous. And she made masks for performances. So she's a lot more than just quilts. She's a lot more than Tar Beach. She's a great thinker. All right, time is up as again, last time, if you would want to take advantage of the, um, we certainly have time for questions and comments and I'll go off stop share. Do you have anything you want to ask about or? Yes, Doris. There was a painting near the beginning, um, was in the oval. Yes, that's her self-portrait. Yes, and I was wondering if the the bulge on, on her stomach was pregnancy. I don't know. I I believe she had her children by then. Okay. So it's just also likely that that's a reference to Picasso's way of showing them. But I'm not sure. Okay. Any others? Let's see what's in chat. <clears throat> Hi there. Hi, Maggie. Oh, Carolyn, you want to go, go ahead? You go first. Uh, I was She's just gonna, living. Yes, she is living. I was just going to comment about the postage stamp in the beginning. I was glad that you pointed that out to me that, you know, the black power and the white power if you didn't point it out, we wouldn't have known about even looking for it. Which is essentially her statement about the way the condensed structure of society in this country, right? Yes. Very good. Yeah, yeah, it's really succinct. I mean, she's, she's got it. Yeah, yeah. So Maggie, yeah. Uh, did she actually paint on the embroidery on the quilts? Yes. Yes, she did. Uh, she does it just on a, you know, on a, on the canvas and then the, it'll be uh, batched and quilted after that. Yeah. Okay. That was amazing. It looked just like quilts. It was actually painted. Well, um, no, with, with those figurines, you know, the, the detail is sometimes so fine. So there's her paintings. You can think of it as a kind of a variation on that first one where she did what I like those tankas. It's just that the borders aren't so big now and it's quilted, but it's a painting in the middle of that. Quilt. The context of women's art. Yeah. Was um, Maggie, was she at all influenced by uh, Rousseau or Rouault? Yes, yes. yes. Because I, I thought the way the uh, outline of the right. faces reminded yeah. me of Rouault and uh, Rousseau as well with the leaves and yeah, the I jungle. Think, I think particularly Rousseau, yeah. 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 I mean, she, she really, she just incorporates the Western tradition. I mean, she is both. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's wonderful. I really enjoyed uh, seeing the range of her work. Yeah. And I, I always only knew it from a few of the quilts, so I didn't have um, aware of the levels of subtlety in what she was doing. You mentioned the, the rivalry between Matisse and Picasso oh, yeah. and how they spurred each other on. It's wonderful. Yeah. And you've gone into the influences on this particular artist today. Did she have a rival who spurred her on, a particular person who she spoke of or uh, exhibited with? I don't know of one, but 
in the, the 70s, there was just such a lively group of conversation where they were really duking it out among feminist women. Uh, one of the parts I, you, you ask things that always make me think of something that's important that I should have said, and I'll say it now. I'm so glad you do. Uh, <laughs> because what she always is interested in, that these are paintings. And you could make just as good a case that these are craft work. She still is a little bit buying into the Western paintings are basically male domain and slightly more valuable than craft, which is female. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She keeps saying that these, these are paintings on canvas, <laughs> on quilts. So, yeah. She's selling but, herself, yeah. So, so that um, I think also her self concept. So there were just very lively discussions about all this, but, and nowadays there are a number of young men who work in fiber arts too. Mm -hmm. So that shifted from what it was in the seventies. So they're really increasingly, well, continue to try to break down these boundaries, but uh, right. yeah. I don't Thank think you. she had any particular rival. You know. That's okay. Thank you. Yeah. What, what is she doing now? What media is she working in? She has a commission now to design some stained glass windows for Yale. Oh, okay. And she's 90 years old. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. And next week, uh, what? Oh, what we're going to do to? more. We're going to do more about the, the world of, of figures and real world. We're going to do Diane Arbus. So oh, we're doing okay. Okay. And then okay. we'll see if we get into Cindy Sherman too. Oh, so, excellent. Yeah. They both about how you represent human beings. Yeah. We wanted to ask you last week. Yeah. Did you see the the documentary made you look? And what were your thoughts on it? The about the art fraud. No. The Nodel, the Nodal Gallery. The Nodler. Nodler the, Gallery. On the Nodler Gallery, um, it's called Made You Look. It's a very interesting documentary. Abstract expressionist fakes. Eighty million dollars worth of uh, sales on 60 fakes over 10 years by the Nodler Gallery and it led to the closing of the Nodler Gallery. But it's, it, please, please go take a look. It's frightening. I think I it's on it. Netflix? Netflix. Netflix. There's one thing I suppressed last time when I was showing the Jackson Pollock, I remember something that I was taught starting out like this. Oh, you cannot fake a Jackson Pollock. It is impossible. It's not only that the chimps can't, but no, the human being can. Oh, then you have to see this, this because <laughs> it talks about Pollock. Because they're saying the reason you can tell you can't, you would have to have exactly his arm length and his musculature so that you would make exactly those same gestures. And I'm always like, mm, yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, they talk about who are the- who There's are a lot the of money at stake. So people find yeah. a way. But Pollock was one of the ones who was, um, that one of the frauds was was Pollock. Uh, yeah. Who were the others? There were a few. So, well, we'll, I don't others. want to ruin it for you. Yeah, why, <laughs> they, definitely. Uh, yeah. Check it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's as good as any British mystery. <laughs> okay. Great. Anybody else? Carolyn uh, is trying to speak. Uh, am, am I muted or unmuted? No, no, no. You are okay. there. Well, I don't have a question. I just wonder if that's what she was doing in the 60s in terms of what's going on, what was going on in the country. Has she done anything in the last uh, four or five years? Would It would seem it would be much gorier than what she had in the uh, 60s. I'm, you know, the last, I, I watched part of a YouTube interview with her. And she's sort of cautiously saying, you know, I'm waiting for something to come to my mind, but that's also a way of saying I'm doing less, but I, I don't know. Yeah. But she did move away from that kind of pretty clear confrontation to deciding that the better way to work was with this like providing a message of uplift with those that like the Aunt Jemima, her difference, her Aunt Jemima from the other one. So I don't know. Maybe she's still as wise old woman want to be say that things will change for the better. We know. Huh. That it? That's it. Okay. Hey, thank you. you. Yep, looking forward to it. Okay. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you.